You know, there are so many titles that are given to Jesus in the Bible, and the closer we get to Christmas, you'll start to hear my favorite one, Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 9-6, Jesus' birth is predicted 750 years before it happens. The prophecy says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And yet, in today's difficult passage that we're about to read, Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. When I first read that, so many years ago, I kind of scratched my head and thought, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. And here he says, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. So which one is it? Is he the Prince of Peace or does he carry a sword? The answer is yes, to both. And so this becomes one of the difficult teachings of Jesus because what does he mean? Is this one of those famous Bible discrepancies I hear so much about? Because we've all seen paintings of Jesus holding a lamb, right, in his arms that's warm and fuzzy and it gives you that precious moments feel. Or Jesus is, uh, you know, sitting in, in, a, in a circle of children and there's one happy child at his, uh, on his lap. But have you ever seen the painting over somebody's fireplace of Jesus holding a giant sword? I haven't. So what does he mean when he makes that statement? Well, let's, let's look at the entire passage. It's found in Mark, Matthew 10. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his sake for my sake will find it. So we got to look at it in the context. And once we read it in the context, we notice that this is something that Jesus says right before we're to take up our cross and follow. That's the same sentence we studied last week. So what is Jesus doing right now? What is chapter 10 all about? Well, he's sending his disciples out to preach the gospel. He's sending them out to advance the kingdom, and he is warning them that there'll be many people who reject their message. But he also warns that some of them, the disciples, will be arrested and killed because of their testimony. You know, so much of what Jesus says is misquoted or it's taken out of context. So we're going to be faithful to the text, and we're going to eliminate what we know Jesus isn't saying. Jesus is not against peace, right? We know that. Jesus is not against peace. Jesus says in John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Jesus knows that there are different kinds of peace, and he came to give us peace, but he reminds us not the kind of peace the world understands. In 2024, people keep talking about world peace. In fact, for years, when I was growing up, whenever there was a a beauty pageant contestant and she was asked a question, what's the most important thing our society needs? The right answer is always world peace. It's the perfect answer to any question. Okay. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the US on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and 
I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Uh, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much, South Carolina. You know, she probably would have been better off if she had just said world peace. But is world peace actually possible? In Matthew 24, Jesus says there will be wars and rumors of wars. And he was right on target. You know, several years ago, historians at West Point Military Academy tried to determine how many years of war and peace we've had over the last 5,000 years. And they concluded that over the past 56 centuries, there have been 14,351 wars and over 3.6 billion people killed in war. They also concluded that of the 5,600 years, there have only been 293 years of peace where there was no war fought. So when Jesus says he didn't come to bring peace to the earth, he is saying it's not his job to end every war. Remember, he said it's not the kind of peace the world understands. He didn't come to bring that kind of peace, but he came to bring another, more important kind of peace. He came to bring the peace that comes from having a relationship with him and creating peace between him and us and God. So Jesus offers you something so much better than just world peace. He offers you peace with God and the peace of God. Romans 5 says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 says, Jesus himself is our peace, having broken down the wall that separates us from God. Colossians says he came to make that peace through the blood of the cross. And Philippians tells us Jesus can give us an inner peace that passes all human understanding. So Jesus is not against peace, but at the same time, Jesus is also not for violence. When Jesus said that he came to bring a sword, we know that he is not speaking literally. Because when he was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter draws his sword to defend Jesus, and Jesus tells Peter, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. The Crusades are a perfect example of how leaders with a lack of biblical understanding use Jesus' words to motivate thousands of people to pick up a sword and declare war against the Muslims who are occupying the Holy Land. Hundreds of thousands died. The Spanish Inquisition justified the torture and murder of Jews and Muslims and even non-Catholic Christians by misquoting scripture like this about Jesus and a sword. But the Christian faith is not about a country that's worth killing for. Christianity is about a relationship with a God that's worth dying for. There's no record that Jesus ever picked up a sword with his own hand. The most agitated we ever see is when he throws out the money changers when they are in the temple. He is angry at racketeering. Jesus didn't attack the people either. He turned over the tables, he drove the cattle out, but there is no indication that he committed any act of violence against any of the people that were running those scams. He didn't hate them, he hated the sin. In fact, Jesus teaches the opposite, just like we've seen in this series. Jesus taught that if somebody strikes you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. He didn't teach retaliation, he taught forgiveness. So what is Jesus talking about? Because he makes the statement, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. The key is found in verse 32. He says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. You know, we're already into September. <laughs> and pretty soon it's going to be November. My family is already trying to make Thanksgiving plans. Trying to figure out where we're going to go, who we're going to spend it with. And to keep peace around the table, what are the two things you are not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving? Politics and religion. Sounds like good advice, but it's not advice we find in the Bible. In fact, Jesus says in our very first verse that we just read, everyone who acknowledges me before men, 
I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Jesus told us to make a profession of faith. Jesus tells us to confess our faith to others. That means we have a responsibility to publicly tell people about our faith. When we acknowledge Jesus before others, he acknowledges us before his Father. Every time you let somebody know that the reason why you're different is because of Jesus, Jesus then turns to his dad and says, that one right there, that one's one of mine. I, I claim that person as my disciple. I claim that one as one of my followers. But as we all know, when you openly confess Jesus like that, there are some consequences that you will face. And not all of them are pleasant. Jesus mentions the consequences and the cost of following him. And this is where the sword enters our life. This is where the cutting takes place. When you confess Jesus as Lord, some people will cut you out of their life. Jesus says in 35, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now, what's interesting here is, and, and, we, don't, and we don't all notice it, but your Bible may have a footnote in that Jesus is actually quoting Micah here, the prophet. This was a passage speaking about a time when people had fallen away from the Lord, a time of heresy. And Jesus quotes part of this passage, and he reminds them that when you mention his name, that when you mention his teaching, this can actually divide a family. But we know Jesus' message. It's all good things, right? So why are some people just so hostile to the message? Why are people hostile to Jesus? Why does Jesus create this dissension. The Apostle Paul even said that the message was a stumbling block because although the gospel is good news, it is preceded by some very bad news. News that we are all sinful, that we all need a savior. You see, the need for a savior isn't a very popular one. For me to accept a savior, I first have to admit my own depravity. And there is something in the human spirit that would rather have a God who affirms that we are good enough just as we are. A God who will say, you know what? Your life balances out between good and bad, so you're safe. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says your life is messed up and you can't fix it. So I'll fix it for you. And you have to be humble and accept that offer. Did you ever have one of your kids get so mad at you because you did something for them <laughs> because they wanted to do it themselves. And I'm sure that some of you have experienced firsthand the division between you and family, between you and friends, between you and a spouse because of the Christian you and it made them uncomfortable. Jesus said that would happen. And you need to understand that it's not because you're doing it wrong, it's because you are doing it right. Listen, if you share your faith, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting him. And this is the sword at work. People will cut you out of their lives. 37 says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This one's a little different because it's not them pulling away from you this time. Here, it's where you might pick up the sword and cut them out of your life. Here's where you might make a choice between Jesus and the influences in your life. And yes, it could be people that you care about. 
And I was holding back. But this is the difficult teaching of this passage. God must be first. This is what God first calls Abraham to do. You may remember God called Abraham to be willing to sacrifice his son. Abraham thought that he wanted a son more than anything else in the world. But sometimes God calls us to make a decision about the priorities that are in our life. What comes first? Do we place God above career? Do we place God above comfort? Do we place God above our personal hopes and dreams, above yes, even father and mother, or son or daughter? Now, does that mean it's acceptable to neglect your family in the name of God? No, of course not. The Apostle Paul says that the person who does not care for their own family is worse than an unbeliever. Caring for and loving your family is part of your service to the Lord. But it cannot and it must not ever take priority of your love and dedication to God. This is the sword at work. What do we need to cut out of our life so that he is first? 38 says, anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I know, we did an entire teaching on this last week, and I wanna circle back and I wanna mention something that maybe we didn't touch on. I read about a career day at a high school, and they invited a representative of the Army and the Air Force and the Marines. So they had the recruiters there, and they were each to give their pitch to the student body. And the first two, the Army and the Air Force, they went over their time. And the Marine recruiter, he only had two minutes to speak. So he stood and they stared at the students, and he finally said, I doubt that there is even three of you who could make it into the Marines. But after this, I want to see those three at my table. And you know what happened? His table was full. Jesus is saying the same thing about being a follower. It's not going to be easy. No wimps. It's going to take determination at every single point of your life. And this is another aspect of the sword doing its work. As we pick up our cross to follow, Jesus' disciples will not all follow. Many will not. Even as Jesus' own disciples were growing in number. And yeah, he was becoming more and more popular. But as his teachings become more difficult, and as the outside pressures started to threaten their safety, many of his disciples left. So when you say, pick up your cross and follow, that statement alone separates. That statement cuts. And this is the reason Jesus says another very difficult thing for us to understand. In Matthew 7, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So our next difficult teaching is to take the narrow path. According to a recent survey, 70% of American Christians believe there is no moral or ethical truth that you can apply to everyone. In other words, most Christians have joined the non-Christian culture that we can set our own standards of right and wrong. In a similar study, there's only 20% of American Christians that say that they should live a life according to God's will. And that's the single most important thing in their life. 20%. I don't know if I'm surprised at the numbers because this is what we see every day. If you find yourself agreeing and following the majority, if we are walking the same path as everybody else, then we have lost sight of the narrow way. We are quickly becoming a society of acceptance. No longer is it acceptable to suggest that there is only one truth 
especially if that truth comes from the Bible. Because if the Bible is God's word, then the Bible is the final authority on life and faith. And yes, there are many paths in this world. There are many ideologies, many choices, but only one way leads to God. Only one way leads to eternal life. And Jesus says that path is narrow. He even mentions the narrow road in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, and that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. In John 10, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. Suggesting that if someone wants to enter the fellowship, they must come through the door that is Christ. That fact even becomes more clearer when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. In other words, all roads do not lead to God. Rather, only one road leads to God, and that's the narrow road. And that is the road that the crowd does not take. And then, on that road, after you've cut all these things out of your life and chosen to follow him, there is blessing. Going back to Matthew 10, Jesus finishes with, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what is the point of this difficult teaching? If we attempt to hold on to our lives and find that we cannot, then we should surrender our lives to him. Then we discover real life. Then we discover real blessing. That phrase, the old ball and chain, <laughs> that began to refer to marriage around 1825, 1835. And it draws on this imagery of a heavy ball and chain attached to a prisoner's leg, which symbolized a restriction on freedom, especially implying that marriage could be seen as something that's limiting. And it keeps us away from the freedoms that we want. But you know, one of Jesus's favorite illustrations was to use marriage as a symbol for our relationship with God. And he said that he was the bridegroom and the church was the bride. But marriage is also about division and cutting, isn't it? When you get married, you both agree to cut every other potential spouse out of your life. And you agree to only be with each other. So no matter how many jokes you hear about giving up your freedom when you get married, anyone who has ever experienced marriage the way it ought to be understands that it's not about what you give up. It's about what you get. When we give our lives to him, our hearts truly find a home because we are created to be in relationship with him. When we surrender to him, our life's purpose is fulfilled. We have a life and we have it abundantly, real life, the way it's supposed to be. So by giving ourselves to him, we don't lose life, we find life. That's the reward for following. That's the reward for walking the narrow road. God wants to give you something today, something more than just a nice Sunday service. He wants to give you his son and he wants to free you. Not free from today or free from tomorrow, but free for forever. That's the gospel. This is the good news. This is what each person who walks the Christian life is thankful for. And if you're thankful, if you're thankful and you want to continue in faith and you want to know this Christ, 
and you're ready to cut all those other distractions out of your life and live for him, then first I would say you have to admit that you're a sinner. There's no shame in admitting that you're not perfect. Because if heaven is a reward for perfect people, then none of us would go. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you decide to follow Jesus, you're still not perfect. But right now, you are surrounded by people who accept you, just as you are, fault and all. A church is a family. It's a family made up of people who are imperfect and who are broken and who are hurting, but we are all a family who loves our Savior. And that takes us to be. We believe in Jesus. Do you believe that God became a man and that he walked among us? Do you believe that Jesus came to show the world what hope and grace and love looked like? Do you believe that Jesus stands ready to offer you a new life and that he is the key? Acts 4 says, there is no salvation by anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we can be saved. So if you can admit that you're a sinner and believe in Jesus, then the Bible says the only thing we have left to do is to confess it. Confess Jesus as King, as your Redeemer, as your Savior. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief and admission, those are the cornerstones of your salvation. And if that sounds like the life you want, if that sounds like the life you've always wanted, then I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from myself and from my sin and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become what you have made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. I would just invite you that if you've prayed that prayer, if you're ready to make that step, please look for and join a local church doesn't have to be the biggest, most popular church in your area. It could be a small church of a hundred. These churches, they need you because they need your gifts and your talents. God has equipped you in a very special way to serve his kingdom. And as you attend a church and as you ask questions, as you meet the other members, you will learn what it means to grow in your faith. The more you put into it, the more you will get out. Read your Bible, pray, ask the Lord for guidance, and find fellowship among other believers. Thank you for watching. God bless you. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.